includes Enigma, which is uh, the company I work for, um, who were gracious enough to um, you know, give me a couple days off work and also pay for uh, you know, my room, and my flight and, and lodgings. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, and I'm really happy to see the turnout here in you know, what is not the largest city in the Philippines, but to see these many, this many people that are excited about learning Python and you know really made the effort to come here uh, is very hard thing. I've given you know talks at a number of Pycons um, all over the world, and um, this turnout is much more than I expected. And I'm really glad to see how much Python is expanding, even in the five or ten years that I've been uh, speaking. Um, so, for this talk, I kind of want to, sorry, I kind of want to have some fun. Um, I've given this talk before, um, it's based on my book, which is called Writing the Magic Python, um, and here's just a little information about me, so obviously I'm the author of the book, um, I'm also a principal engineer at Enigma, which is a startup in New York City. Um, so if I seem very tired, it's because to me it's like 10:30 at night. Um, I should be putting my, I just put my kids to bed and going to sleep about now. Um, also, if my jokes aren't funny, that's also why because I'm, I'm just too tired. Um, I also have uh, I'm the author of a uh, library called Sandman that um, has been the number one. Python project on GitHub a number of times, um, and uh, is used by uh, a large number of people. Um, and, and I may be best known for my blog, which is at jeffdump.com. Um, I don't know if you've been there before, but if you go to Google anything about Python, you probably have been, even if you don't realize it. Um, it picks about 100,000 visitors a month, and all of the uh, stuff that I write about is really aimed at novice and intermediate developers and, and trying to explain some of Python's harder concepts. Now that's not what I'm going to do today. Today, this talk is not about explaining difficult concepts. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It's figuring out how to figuring out how to get the concepts that make Python Python um, and incorporate that in our code and We'll see, we'll see why that's important in a second. Um, so, what's the format for this talk? So, like I said, I've, I've done this a number of times before, um, this talk or variations of it. Um, but I always wish that, you know, I could have a dynamic, um, a dynamic conversation with, you know, the audience. But of course, that's not really feasible. So, um, what I'm gonna do is, Using the uh, the power of magic, um, I'm going to introduce myself from 10 or 15 years ago um, when I was just starting out as a professional programmer. I thought I knew everything. I didn't care. I didn't listen to what people said um, most of the time. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll call that version of me Noob Jeff, and Noob Jeff is going to be asking questions, and, and I'm going to be answering. Them for him. He's, he's kind of sarcastic and you know thinks he knows everything, but each of the the uh, the title of the uh, slides is going to be a, a question from him. Um, and the one thing is, you know, new Jeff, and, and this really was me. I, I may have thought I knew everything, but I was still curious and, and you know looking to learn more. So. Hopefully that um, describes all of you as well. Um, even if you think you know everything, and some of you maybe do, um, hopefully you'll get something out of this talk regardless. So, new Jeff says, what's this about anyway? Well, yeah, it's about writing a Mac Python, of course. Um, but, okay, what's the, what's the point of this talk then? Well, the, the point of this talk is that Python is, whoa, oh. Python's only getting more popular as we see in data science 
um, you know, in the physical sciences. And we got a lot. We have a lot of big influx of people that are using Python, but don't have a background in computer science, which is great. And one of the reasons that Python is so popular is because it's so approachable, and, and people can get productive very quickly in Python. You know, you can read it almost like you're reading just a description of what the computer is supposed to do, um, and that's great. But unless we, as Python developers, teach them the correct way to write Python, we're going to be in for a big shot in the next, say, five or 10 years. So if you want Python to continue to grow in popularity, then write Pythonic code that the code can follow. And then we'll talk about what Pythonic code is. Um, and if you don't want to be maintaining crazy legacy systems 10 years from now, and that that be your only job is to, oh, that guy knows Python, so no one else does. Um, and no one likes to program in it, in it anymore because it's so not understandable. If you don't want that to happen, then teach others to write idiomatic Python. So here are the obvious questions. What is idiomatic Python? How do you write it? And most importantly, why should you care? Um, you know, I, I gave you some examples there, but really, you know, it's, I, I'm asking you to change the way that you write your code. So that's a big ask, right? Because that's, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we're all doing is writing code. So I'm going to explain to you why you should care. Hopefully, by the end of this, you, you will care. Um, and I've got some, some easy next steps for you guys to take if you are convinced by my super convincing arguments. Um, so what is it? Um, idiomatic Python is just another way of saying code that is Pythonic. Um, you've probably all heard the word Pythonic before, um, but it's one of those words that's useless because it's almost self-referential. It, it, you can't figure out what Pythonic means because it's just a word that they made up um, to describe things that are Pythonic. So what is that actually? So it's an adjective. You, you, you use it you know, to describe code. Um, and it really just means code that's written in the way that the Python community has agreed is the right way to write Python. Um, so that is the idiomatic Python and Pythonic. They're basically synonyms. But this is what it's really all about. It's just the right way to write Python. And you might be thinking, well, there's no real right way. And to that I will say, you're wrong. There is. Um, and I'll give you examples. If there's no, and even if there's no right way, there are certainly many, many wrong ways. Um, and we'll go over a couple of, of them um, a little later. So, you know, an example of using Pythonic in a sentence is the, the way that you are looking at every key in a dictionary to, to find a certain value, um, that's not Pythonic because you can just go directly to a key because it's just basically a hash table. But I've seen so many um, you know, novice programmers that are looking for a certain key in a dictionary, not a value, but a key, and they use a for loop to check if the key is equal to my key. This is the element in the dictionary I'm looking for. Um, so that's an example of something that's not Pythonic. And like I said, idiomatic is the synonym here. So who decides what is Pythonic or what is idiomatic? Um, me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'd love for that to be the case, but um, then no one would care. So uh, it's really uh, the Python developers, the community, through the code that they write, the code that they share, the code that they review and, and criticize, things you'll see on, you know, uh, comments you'll see on GitHub pull requests. Uh, you know, can you please change this to do to be more Pythonic by doing X? Um, but also, it's just if you take the top, say, 10, 15 uh, Python projects on GitHub, clone them, and start reading the code, you'll notice patterns start to emerge. And those patterns are the idioms that I'm talking about. And it's not how you lay out your files. It's not 
um, you know, what you name things. There are PDPs for, you know, naming and things like that. But it's more how you do the, the specific kind of everyday programming tasks the right way. Um, and we'll see what I mean, you'll see what I mean by that in a second. But really, who, the, the people who decide what's Pythonic is the Python developers. Now, that's, there are a, a few corner cases where um, the BDFL, so, so Guido, or a PDP author decides what's Pythonic because they're adding something new to the language um, and that, you know, by default becomes the right way to do it because it's, the, it's new and it's the only way to do it. Um, but it's, it really is the, the Python community. Um, and once, now that we know kind of what Pythonic and what idiomatic means, why should you care? Um, there are three main reasons. It increases your code's readability, it makes your code more maintainable, and it is easier to prove a program's correctness when you write idiomatic code. So the way that this all started, this whole, my whole journey with what is idiomatic, what is Pythonic, um, I was working uh, at an investment bank writing C++ high frequency trading servers. Um, and we had some scripts that were written in Python. And everyone that was on the team that had to write Python scripts were writing them as if they were writing C++. And it looked really weird. Um, it was impossible to follow. And it was impossible to maintain. That's, that's the biggest part. Um, so I you know, create a little presentation and we had a, a meeting, a team meeting with four people um, and I, I showed them, here are some common, you know, ways to, here are the, the correct ways to do common things. Uh, that then turned into a post on my blog, which then turned into the book, um, but it really comes from wanting to get across the fact that if you don't do this, it's going to be very difficult for people to read your code and for you yourself to maintain your code. Also, people in code reviews will stop laughing at your code behind your back. And, and that does happen to you, I think, and maybe you, no. Um, but in all honesty, you know, when you say commit to, or submit a pull request to a project on GitHub, um, these are the kinds of things that maintainers are going to be looking for, and it's kind of like the, the minimum barrier to submitting something. Um, you know, they're going to ask you to make changes, so why not just save everyone some time and write it correctly the first time? So now, a brief, uh, a brief side note. When people, when I tell people, you, you know, you need to write idiomatic code, and they're like, oh, don't tell me how to write my code because I'm this special snowflake and, you know, I don't have to write code in the way that you say because, you know, I, I, I'm in a different situation. I'm not a developer or whatever. Um, so here's what I say to, to these common arguments. Um, some people in the, in the sciences will say, I'm not a programmer. I'm, I'm a, you know, noun adjective scientist, so I'm a um, data, <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to think of an adjective. What's that? Data scientist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll go with that. But really, the, it's even more important that you write your code in a way that's understandable and maintainable. Because if you want your, your research to be peer reviewed, it's becoming more and more common to require that the code be presented with the actual research. So this is, you know, for journals, um, it's, it's rare, but it's becoming more common. But just, you know, to be able to recreate the results of experiments and stuff. Um, you, you're not going to get peer reviewed, you're going to get peer ignored. No one is going to want to read your, your findings because they can't follow your code. And that's a big, you know, negative 
outcome of because you didn't write code the right way in the first place. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a very impactful, I guess, a very big, yeah, a big negative outcome, right? So if you're a scientist, you, you know, you need to get your, your work peer reviewed. And if no one does it, then, I mean, you're not really a scientist, you're just someone who does science for fun and, you know, no one ever finds out what happened. Um, this is my least favorite. Um, I'm, I'm not a programmer, I just write scripts. I just write Python scripts. I don't write programs. They're just scripts. I, you know, they're, they're one-off things that I'm never going to use again. To me, that's like saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not a thief. I just steal small things. It's, it's totally different. But when you write a program in Python, you are a Python programmer. And you have to operate as if you are a, a Python programmer. You know, it, it's the same in any language. If it's not just Python, it's, you know, Java, PHP, Ruby, Scala, Pascal, Pony, I don't know. Um, so you have to assume the, the guise of a person that's writing Python, because ultimately, the script that you write that you thought was never going to be used again is going to be used for 10 years in your company and maintained by 64 different people, all of whom are too scared to touch it because they can't understand what it does. And suddenly, your script is now like the backbone of, of your company, and no one knows what it does or how it does it. Um, and it, everyone has seen this if, if they've been in the software development long enough. Um, you have things that you're too afraid to touch because you just don't know how they work. And, and if the person had taken a little time and a little forethought, given a little forethought, it would, they would have made your job a lot easier. Um, so, if you do this, I will find you and, and I will just bombard you with spam because ultimately the, Python, the people here, the developers here, are going to be the ones that are maintaining your stupid script that you decided you don't have to write well because it's just a script and I'm going to do it on behalf of them. So I, I wrote a Python script to spam you guys. No, I'm just um, here, uh, another one that's that's common is you know I'm coming from from another programming language um, and I, I want to write Python just like I was writing that other language, but do it in Python. So if, if Java is an example, can, you know can I add factory and abstract interface to all my class names and that make everything a class and um, let Oracle buy my, my language. Um, no, that's not Python, right? The, the point is that idioms are what makes Python Python. That would be some weird combination of Python and Java, which you know we may call Jython or something. You know, I think I should look into that name. Seems like a pretty good, uh, pretty good idea. So. If you write Python as Java, other programmers don't, won't be able to maintain your code. It's all about readability, maintainability, and correctness, right? So, unless they're also, they also happen to be Java programmers coming to Python, um, which you know is a is a great moment in everyone's life that was a Java programmer. Um, they're not going to be able to understand it because it's, it looks like Java. Oh, this guy cut off. Great. Um, I don't even know what the bottom part says, so let's <laughs> not, not important. Okay, so that's all great, but how's it, how's it help readability? Um, so readability, I use this metric that I call cognitive burden, and it's a, a term that some of you might have heard, um, and it really refers to how much information do I have to keep in my head while I'm reading your program to make sense of it? 
So, for example, if I'm reading, you know, a script or something, um, and you call a variable foo and set it to the result of some function call, well, foo is not a good name for variable. So now I have to remember, okay, foo is the result of that. Um, and the more you do that, the 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 more and more difficult it becomes for me to read your code. Even if it's good code, it's just you want you, the cognitive burden is too high. And when you put that cognitive burden on the reader, they're really unlikely to be able to, not only to be able to read your code, but to want to read your code. Like for me, I can, I can maybe fit three things. I know it says two, but maybe three. I've been working really hard. Um, and that's, that's about it, though. You know, with too much branching, too, much, too many if statements, a class with inheritance seven le levels deep, those are the kinds of things that increase cognitive burden on the reader. And your job as a Python developer is to keep the cognitive burden to a minimum, uh, within reason, right? I mean, there, there are some things that we expect the reader to know, but we don't expect it to be work for them to read our code. And the other thing is, the person who's, gonna, who's most likely to have to read your code is you six months from now. So all you're doing is helping yourself out. And we've all been in that situation where we come back to something that we wrote six months ago and we look at it and what in the world, do, what does this do? I wrote it, but I don't, I don't understand it. And, and everyone's been there, and that's the, the biggest, one, one of the biggest benefits of writing idiomatic code. Okay, so I haven't quoted Nuth yet, and that's in any talk about anything tangentially related to computer science. You have to quote Nuth, it's like a law. I would get fined otherwise. Uh, so, but this is, you know, particularly applicable. So instead of imagining that our main task is to instruct a computer what to do, let's concentrate on explaining to human beings what we want the program to do, or the computer to do. And, and really, that describes almost the, 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 um, the core of Python, basically. It's, it's so readable that you almost are reading exactly what the programmer wanted the computer to do. But there are so many ways to make that, to, to mess that up and make that so much harder to read. So, so let's, you know, we can all write, um, you know, Fibonacci sequence generator or something, but let's write it in a, in a way that we make it clear what we're doing. And I, I have some, Silly examples, um, <clears throat> but this is the other thing. One of my favorite quotes, um, and it, it opens the book. It opens my book, um, and this is back from I think the early '90s on um, C++ um, news group. But it's always code as if the person who's going to maintain it is a violent psychopath that knows where you live. So. Imagine that, you know, I have to keep this code good because otherwise that, that guy is going to come and try to murder my family. And, and it's going to happen. And remember, you're often going to be that violent psychopath because you're the one maintaining your code. And all you want to do is slap yourself in the face and say, why did I write this so, so terribly? Um, so now, hopefully, Noob Jeff is, is scared. He, he, he's convinced. Um, how does idiomatic Python help, though? If you're the only one who can read your code, then correctness is irrelevant. So I would argue that a correct working piece of code that no one can read but the author is far less valuable than a very readable piece of code with a couple of bugs that are obvious upon review. Because the, the latter is going to become easy to maintain, and those bugs are going to be easy to spot. The former is going to be one of those things that 
It works, we can never touch it. Don't ever open that file. It just works. So working bad but working code is not a victimless crime. You know, there are gonna be people who are, are scared. They, you, you can't go, don't go into that directory because that's where the bad code lives. So how do you make sure that other people can read your code? You know, this, this is kind of getting to the heart of what it means to be Pythonic and idiomatic. And really, Pythonic code or idiomatic code always makes the author's intention clear. So it may not always be correct. You know, I'm not saying that, that by doing this, all your code is just going to magically work the first time and you're gonna be a super programmer and put me out of a job. But I'm saying that it's going to be much easier for somebody else to spot errors in your code because you're focusing on, or they're able to see what you intended to do. Here's a, a non-idiomatic example um, that, that I've seen. Um, so somebody is, you know, iterating over a list, and they want to keep track of the index that they're currently on because they're going to do something with that index later. Um, there is a correct way to do this, which we'll see in a second, but it, and it involves enumerate. Um, but when I see this, I get I get like paranoid. I think, okay, why why do they do this? There's got to be something I'm missing. And, and it just gets to the point where I just, you know, fall apart, go home for the day, take a nap. I, I can't, you know, I can no longer be sure of myself when I'm doing this code review because I, I think that this is a smart person. They must have had a reason for doing this. Maybe I'm not smart enough to figure it out. Okay, let's sit down and look at this loop and see what's going on. So rather than, you know, forcing me to just turn into a pile of jelly mush. Let's figure out how we can write these things more, more idiomatically. Um, so let's look at this function called do calculation. So anyone, what, what does this do? What does this function do? So people are whispering, but yell it out. Huh? <laughs> Sorry, what, what are people saying? Average, okay, yeah, okay, I mean, yeah. It, it is calculating the average. Um, but how much time does it take you to, you know, with the name, do calculation, the doc string that is absolutely useless, <laughs> variable names A and B, how long does it take you to figure out that versus this? Right? So this is idiomatic code. This is all of the parts of the code working together. And actually, this is it's kind of a lie, because this isn't even idiomatic code. This would be idiomatic code, if not for Python 3.4, where we got this. So part of writing the idiomatic code is staying up to date and knowing <laughs> changes to the language and understanding how they affect your code or the code that you write in the future. Okay, so you know we talked about maintainability, but correctness. Like I said, correctness is not is not that your code is going to be correct. It's that you can spot errors, or others can spot errors, more easily. So automated tools will find issues regardless of how complex you write your code. Humans will not. If you write your code in a very complex way, humans just give up. Usually after like two minutes. Like, I mean, they'll be like, okay, yeah, approved. I don't care if it's the unit test pass, whatever. Um, but logically here, and the way that you do it is clear, 
it's easier for other people to find flaws in your thinking. So if you don't do that, and you write code in some inscrutable way, how likely is a reviewer to spot a bug in your code when, it's, when they, they have to spend so much time just figuring out what it's even trying to do? And how likely is it, going, is it that they'll spend that time, that extra time, figuring out what your code is trying to do? And how likely are they gonna care the next time you write code and, they, and you, you know, submit a code review? You're gonna be that guy that just gets code reviews back instantly because no one wants to read your code. And that's great for you, you know, but ultimately it's, it's not sustainable. I don't know why I wrote checkmate there. So people will say, I'm, you know, noob Jeff, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's not the nicest guy. He says, I'll hate to write code, not read it. Reading and writing are intimately intertwined when it comes to Python or any language because you, future you, are the most frequent reader of the code you write. I talked about that, you know, when you look back at something you wrote six months ago and you just want to slap past you in the face and say, what were you doing? Why? Why, why are you making my life terrible and miserable now? because now I have to go through, and I wrote this code. So, ultimately, you're, by writing any amount of code, you're only helping yourself. So, like we said, any amount of code doesn't make the code itself more correct, it makes flaws and small logic errors much more obvious. So, reviewers can focus on what the code does, not what they're trying to do, and in almost every case, the, the way to do something, there's already a way to do it that's been established by the community. So the what is the reason that the program is being written. So you don't want to fo have to focus on the how. You want reviewers to be able to focus on the what. You want yourself to be able to focus on the what. What is this code actually doing? So if there were 50 ways to iterate over a list, code reviews would be impossible because you would have to look at each iteration and figure out, are they doing it right? Is this one of those 50? Let me see, let me get my list iteration reference manual and see, does it match up? No, I mean, it, it's just, it would not be possible to do code reviews. When you write non idiomatic code, now as the reviewer, not only do I have to check if your code is right, I have to check if you're iter iterating over a list correctly. You know, maybe you, you have an off by one error in a range or something. Um, and because there's already a, a way to do that, a correct way to do that, it, it puts the burden on me rather than you, as me as the reviewer, and there should be no burden on me, or as little as possible. Reducing the cognitive burden of reading your code. So, finally, let's see some examples. Um, the first one, very common, um, we talked about it uh, earlier, where you're calculating an index because you want to figure out where in the list a certain value occurs, um, and you are incrementing, you set a, a, a variable to zero, and then you increment it each time through the list until you find it, and let's just say there's a break there. I, that actually is not, whatever. Oh, it's printing them out, that's why, okay. Um, but there's already a built-in function that does this. It's called enumerate. And you give it a sequence, and it gives you back the index and the value of that index of, of the sequence. So that's the idiomatic way to do exactly this. So now you can think, Whenever I need to use an, whenever I need to use the index of something, I know that I can just go to enumerate, and that's one idiom that you can apply to your own code. Here's another one. So, assume we're writing, you know, a, a analysis thing for Twitter, um, and we we want to get 
the most popular and most active users. And we have a function for each, one that returns the most popular users, one that returns the most active users, and we want to see which users are in both lists. So you could iterate, you could call both those functions, iterate over one, check each element to see if it's in the other one, append it to some value list that you're keeping track of, or you could use sets. So sets and, and the operations on sets are ridiculously easy to use and absolutely perfect for things like this. So what we're saying here is turn the result of, that function, of each function call into a set and then use the union operator to tell me everything that's in both lists. And this is idiomatic Python. And if you can, it's not just though because it's shorter. So it's not, it's, readability is, is not necessarily about length. It's about removing the cognitive burden. So remember, if you look at the harmful code, you have to keep a lot of things in your head, even though they're, you know, the variable names are not A and B, you, you still have to remember what you're doing at each piece of, you know, at, at each line of the code, and, and it's difficult. You have to keep things in your own memory. And, you know, just like Python, and the Python interpreter, you have a limited amount of memory. So, I mean, you, you don't want an out of memory error on yourself, because you end up in the hospital, and it's terrible, I don't know. So, uh, <clears throat> this, this is a, a very, very simple one, um, and one that I see all the time not being used, um, but um, when you're checking for the existence of something in a, in a list or, or you know, some um, sequence, using the in operator to get, you know, does it exist, yes or no, um, that's, that is the idiomatic way to do it. Because imagine this, this list was, there were 10 possible names that we were looking for. That first if statement got a lot longer. Um, but, you know, the, the second one is just enumerating, it's, it's just checking whether the name is in and then, you know, whatever list you give it. So, again, the, the in operator is using it as idiomatic to determine if something is a member um, of a sequence. So, those are just a few examples. Um, you know, obviously, my book is literally just pages and pages of examples like that, but my blog has um, a, a ton of examples. There are many more um, out there on the internet that are freely available. Uh, I know Raymond Hedinger um, has some talks on, you know, idiomatic Python, and um, there's all kinds of freely available reference material for figuring out what these idioms actually are. Um, you know, we saw three very simple ones today. They're, they do get more complex, but really not to the point that a novice would be overwhelmed by it, because that's the point, right? I mean, we want people to be able to read our code, and if we can't even understand an idiom, then it's not an idiom, it's just wrong. Um, so, I want you guys to come away with this, having been convinced by my awesome speaking skills, that writing idiomatic Python is important. That it's something that you should do, and it's something that, that everyone needs to do. And if you're already doing it, then it's important to go out and tell others who aren't and help them write idiomatic Python, whether that's in code reviews or on pull requests or blog articles. Um, that's the job of each and every one of you. Um, and like I said, you know, if you don't want to spend the next 20 years maintaining legacy code that, that no one understands, let's teach newcomers to write idiomatic Python. 
So how, if, if you don't know what idioms are, do you, do you learn them? There is only one way that I know of, and that's to read code. So you become, by reading other people's code, you become a much better programmer than just by writing code the wrong way a hundred times. And it's only through reading code that you get exposed to these idioms and learn them and apply them in your own code. Um, so, but, you know, ideally you have a mentor or someone who, who can help out. But really, if you're new to the language, take the time to go out and read some of the good code, look for patterns, and then apply them to your own code. And that's really all that idiomatic Python or Pythonic code is. So, with that, um, I uh, appreciate you guys having me here, and I hope that you learned something. Um, and I'm really hopeful that, you know, with, with a, especially with a group like this, that you will go out and you will look back at your own code, because I do that all the time now. I look at code that I wrote in blog articles, and, I, and I'm like, oh, that's terrible. Why did I and I, and I fix it? But you know, it's it's everyone's responsibility to both learn the idioms and to teach them to others, and that's the way that Python stays that really approachable language. That's the way that the the sciences keep using Python as their language of choice. And that's the way that Python popularity allows conferences like this to take place into the far, far future. So with that, thank you.